In this video, we'll talk about all things proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So let's start off with a little bit of the anatomy so we're all on the same page. When we look at the bony structures, we have our spine in the middle here, and then we have the pelvis, and then over on the side we have the femur, which is your leg bone. On the bottom of the pelvis, we have this area here, which is called the ischial tuberosity, which is where the hamstrings attach. And there's three different muscles that form the hamstring group. We have the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus muscles, which are on the inside part of the back of the leg, and then we have the biceps femoris, which is on the outside part of the back side of the leg. But when we look at how they actually attach onto the ischial tuberosity, they actually twist a little bit. So the semimembranosus actually attaches on the outside part of the ischial tuberosity and then crosses over. It's actually the muscle that's thought to be most involved with proximal hamstring tendinopathy. And then we have the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus that actually form onto one tendon and actually attach onto the inside part of the ischial tuberosity. And there's one other anatomical structure that might be relevant for those with proximal hamstring tendinopathy, and that's this yellow thing here, which is our sciatic nerve. So we can see that it comes out of the spine and down through the back of the leg, and it actually runs in pretty close proximity to the hamstrings and where they insert onto that ischial tuberosity. So if we have irritation of these muscles, it can also lead to some irritation of the sciatic nerve leading to symptoms of sciatica. So when we're looking at diagnosing proximal hamstring tendinopathy, we want to make sure that there's no involvement of the sciatic nerve or if there's involvement of the sciatic nerve because that's going to inform us on how we're actually going to approach treatment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy as well as sciatica. So what causes proximal hamstring tendinopathy? Well, tendinopathies are overload conditions, meaning that the loads that we're placing on the tendon have exceeded what they can tolerate, and that leads to pain. But when we look at the proximal hamstring tendon, we can also see that it's not just tensile loading, but it might also be compressive loading as well. So when the hip actually goes into flexion, it can compress the tendon against the ischial tuberosity, and that can have similar effects as actually just tensile loading. And so things like squats, deadlifts, and lunges can be irritating movements for that proximal hamstring tendon, as well as sitting for long periods of time. And I think it's really important to mention here, for the development of proximal hamstring tendinopathy, we need a combination of tensile loading and compressive loading, not just compressive loading. And the reason why I think this is so important to mention here is that there's a lot of fear around compressive loading, which means that people will avoid hip flexion. And if we know anything about hip flexion, it's required for a lot of things, including sitting. And so one, it's not feasible to actually completely avoid hip flexion, although we do know that it can be a provocative position for those with proximal hamstring tendinopathy, but we need to eventually add in those compressive loads so that we can eventually tolerate those movements, including sitting. The assessment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy is similar to how we approach other tendinopathies. Generally, we're looking for localized pain. So for the proximal hamstring tendon, we're looking for pain right at the ischial tuberosity. That's worse with some sort of loading. So like we were saying before, usually that's squats, deadlifts, lunges, anything that works the hamstrings under that tensile load plus compression. When assessing how the proximal hamstring tendon responds to load, we want to load it as a hip extender instead of a knee flexor, which is what we typically think of when we think of activating the hamstrings. And so one way we can do this is with a long lever bridge where we're going to have our feet out far away from us and try to lift up our hips. That'll activate the hamstrings a little bit more than the glutes and see how it tolerates the load. As part of the assessment, we want to make sure that the pain's not coming from the lumbar spine or from sciatic nerve involvement as well. And so one way we can do this is with a slump test. We'll start in a seated position. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're actually just going to flex our spine as much as we can in this position. Typically, we put our hands behind our back as well and then look down towards the ground. And if we have any reproduction of the pain, then we think that it might actually be from either the sciatic nerve or from the lumbar spine instead of that proximal hamstring tendon. We can further increase the challenge on the sciatic nerve by extending the leg that we're having the pain on and then pointing our toes up towards us, which will put the most tension on that sciatic nerve. So if we get a reproduction of the pain, especially if we get numbness and tingling down into the calf and to the foot, then we might suspect that there's sciatic nerve involvement as well. And since we're talking about the assessment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy, we should probably talk about imaging here as well. And in general, we don't need imaging for proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So an x-ray, an ultrasound, or an MRI, unless we suspect that there's something else that's causing the pain. So for example, maybe there's a suspicion that there was an avulsion fracture. But if we took a thorough history and exam, we would already be suspecting that there's something else going on. So for an avulsion fracture, for example, there's usually a sudden movement, so maybe they were kicking a soccer ball and they suddenly felt pain at that ischial tuberosity and they felt a pop as well. 
And that thorough history and exam would let us kind of sort out whether we think it's the proximal hamstring tendon or something else and whether imaging would be needed. Now an ultrasound or an MRI will give us some information about the structure of the proximal hamstring tendon, but that information probably isn't going to change treatment that much. And the reason is because the amount of structural changes isn't strongly associated with pain, nor do those structural changes need to change for recovery. So while we do get some additional information from the imaging, it doesn't actually change our treatment that much. The treatment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy has changed a little bit since my previous video. The traditional exercise progression used started with isometric exercises, then progressing to concentric eccentric exercises, and then finally progressing to plyometric exercises. And we can still use this general framework for the treatment of proximal hamstring tendinopathy, but the isometric stage is actually optional. And the reason is because the original uh, research was on the patellar tendon, which found that isometric exercises had a pain relieving effect. But this pain relieving effect has been found to actually be really variable in people with tendinopathies and hasn't been replicated in other tendinopathies. So that's why the isometric stage is optional. The reason why we might start off in the isometric stage is if we have a tendon that's just really irritated and not tolerating load that well, or if we have a tendon that just doesn't tolerate hip flexion that well. And so we could start off with a long lever bridge and we wanna start with our feet closest to us and that'll allow us to recruit a little bit more glute and a little bit less hamstring and then gradually work our legs further and further away from us to increase the load on that proximal hamstring tendon. Additionally, we can switch from a two leg long lever bridge to a single leg bridge to further increase the load on the tendon. Another option for a tendon that's not tolerating hip extension with that long lever bridge is to actually go prone and just do a leg curl where we'll be working more of the distal part of the hamstring. Because the hip is in more of a, just a neutral position and not flexed at all, generally this isn't provocative for the hamstring and allows us to gradually increase the load on the hamstring. For a lot of cases, we can start at the concentric eccentric loading and modify either the hip range of motion or the load that we're placing on the proximal hamstring tendon if we need to. And we can build off of that long lever bridge by having our feet out in front of us and then slowly raising our hips up off the ground over three to four seconds and then slowly back down to the ground. To further increase the difficulty of this exercise, we can actually have our feet elevated so our hip will have to go through a larger range of motion and then again, slowly raise over three to four seconds and then slowly back down. And again, just like for the long lever bridge that we did in the isometric phase, the further out our feet are from us, the harder it's going to be. And we can also progress these to a single leg variation, which is a lot harder, but we're working on trying to build up the capacity of that hamstring tendon through a full range of motion. And once we're able to load those long lever bridges through a full range of motion, and as we progress to some standing exercises next, this might actually be a good time to start incorporating some stretching for the hamstrings. And I know people are very opinionated about stretching for tendons and specifically for proximal hamstring tendinopathy. But the way to think about stretching is that it's a way to gradually expose the tendon to end range position. So more and more into hip flexion, which is what we're going to be doing when we're in a standing position. So it makes sense to start with some lower load uh, ways of doing that, which is through stretching, as we start to increase the load on that proximal hamstring at end range. For our standing exercises, we can start with a hip hinge. And what we'll do for the hip hinge is we're gonna push our hips back towards the wall behind us while trying to keep our spine relatively still. And so if we look at the difference between the hip hinge and stretching the hamstrings, the only real difference is if we're moving our spine or not. So when we're stretching our hamstrings, we're flexing and trying to reach down towards the ground. For the hip hinge, we're just trying to push our hips back towards the wall behind us. And there are multiple ways to strengthen the hamstring in this position. The most simple way is to actually just turn this hip hinge into a deadlift by adding some weight. We can use a kettlebell, a dumbbell, a barbell, or even an exercise band to just add a little bit of resistance to the movement. And we can progress the deadlift into a single leg deadlift. And if you've ever seen one of those drinking bird toys, that's essentially what you're gonna look like. So we're gonna focus on just moving through the hips. Everything else is gonna remain still. So we're gonna bend at the hip so that we're looking down towards the ground and then return back to that standing position. And then of course we can add load to this exercise. One variation that I actually like to do with this is to actually add an exercise band anchored in front of us so that we have to work on extending the hip. We can also again add a kettlebell or a dumbbell to this exercise to also increase the load of it. 
Another exercise progression that we can use are some squat variations. And this is especially helpful for those with pain with sitting because we're starting to load that hip in a lot more flexion. And so we might start off with a wall sit where we might start where it's tolerable, so a little bit higher up, and then gradually get our hips lower and lower so we're working under more hip flexion. We might hold this for 30 to 45 seconds. And then again, we can switch to some single leg variations of the wall sit to further increase the load on that hamstring tendon. And then of course we can progress to just some regular squats. We might start off with like a box squat so we limit how much hip flexion we go into and then gradually work our way down lower and lower into the squat. And then of course we can add some load to this as well so that we're further increasing the challenge on that proximal hamstring tendon through a full range of motion. When it comes to progressing to plyometric exercises, it really depends on what our goals are. And plyometric exercises actually aren't needed for everybody, but if we're trying to return to an activity that requires quick loads on the tendon, so running or jumping for example, then we wanna make sure that the tendon is able to tolerate those quick loads. A plyometric exercise progression that we might use for running for example, might start off with some bunny hops where we're working to just expose the tendon to some quicker loads but limiting the range of motion that the hip is going through. And then we can progress to some single leg bunny hops where we're just increasing the load that the tendon is going through but still limiting the range of motion of the hip. Then we might progress to some squat jumps where we're increasing the range of motion at the hip and we're also increasing the force going through that tendon. Finally, we might go through uh, some jumping lunges where we're isolating one tendon with each jump and so that way we're really exposing the tendon to some higher loads that simulates what we're going to experience when we're running. Obviously we're building a bigger capacity than what we're actually going to experience during running but it makes sure that we're having a margin for when we actually return back to running. So hopefully this information on proximal hamstring tendinopathy was helpful. If it was, go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. I mean, you made it to the end, so hopefully you found something helpful out of this. It'll also help other people with proximal hamstring tendinopathy find this video. Uh, I'll link a couple other videos that go over some more specific things with proximal hamstring tendinopathy, but leave me a comment down below as well. Let me know how you're doing, and I'll see you guys in the next video.